Bum 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 bum. Tomatoes. Hello, welcome to the video for what is the struct, the hit result. I fired up a quick little example. Let's just run through it in action. Basically, I have three spheres here. They're all using line traces and firing forward, and they are hitting either a wall or this little actor node that I've, actor blueprint that I've created, and we're going to see the hit result and break it down. So, the hit result is this giant monstrosity here. It's a structure that contains a bunch of other variables. Usually the struct hit result is the result of a line trace or a sphere trace or some other type of trace where basically we have a starting and an end point. We look to see what may have been hit in the middle of that or any point of it or if we're using a sphere trace, anything that was hit in the sphere. And then our hit result is basically the result of what was hit. So breaking the hit result apart, we get this right here. We're going to go ahead and go through each group, each variable, and then explain what they do and give a short example. You can ignore this section for now. We're going to get to it shortly. So let me go ahead and hook up a print string to my line trace. Like I said, I'm doing a simple line trace from the starting position of my sphere forward about a thousand units. Anytime it hits something, we're going to go ahead and print string, but I'm using this for debugging. We're simply going to pause execution so we can look at the hit result itself. Now our hit result is a struct. If we look at it right here, it's just simply going to output a struct. We can either split the struct to get all of the components, or we can use the common break hit result and it'll give us all the same results as well. Keep in mind, some of these only work with certain results. A bone name will only work for hitting a skeletal mesh. The impact point for the most part, it, sorry, the impact, the normal for the most part is only going to work with a sphere trace. And there's a few other things in here. Like, when we'll cover them when we go over it. So let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. When we have a hit result here and we break it apart, if we're not doing anything with the results themselves, they're never going to be called and we actually will get the default values for everything. As you can see, you'll get back false for your booleans, you'll get back zero for your time, zeros for your vectors, all the way down to nothing. What we need to do is simply access one of our variables and run it again. Now we can actually get results back that are valid for our hit, and we're going to go over them. So the first one is blocking hit. Was there an actual hit from this hit result? Is it true or false? If it was true, then we have a blocking hit. If it was false, nothing was hit by our trace. Initial overlap. Basically, some of your traces allow you to have the start point of your trace affected by the trace itself. If that's set to true, this is going to let you know you had an initial overlap, and it's going to let you know the time for that initial overlap. For the most part, most of the time you'll be using things like line traces, where initial overlap is disabled, and you won't have to worry about this. But if this is true, you'll know that this line trace was affected by the originator. Time. Time is basically the distance from start to end in a 0 to 1 range for how long it took before it hit the current target, before it actually had a hit. Now I'm looking at the first line trace right now. It's going to be the line trace to this item right here, not the wall, but my new actor. Due to that, it took 0 0.22 and a few other points in order to get to there. So it took roughly one quarter of the time from start to end in order for one quarter of the distance, sorry. Basically one quarter of the distance from start to end in order for it to hit a target. It says time, but it's basically a range between the start and the end, between zero and one. If I was to resume this, we're gonna get the next hit. You're gonna notice this one's gonna have that for the time. Actually, I've got the wrong one. Let's do this one and resume, there we go. You're gonna notice our time is now 0 0.3. This is going to be a line trace 
from one of these other items to the wall. And as you notice, it is farther back, so it takes longer to trace. Therefore, the distance from our start to our hit point is going to be longer. And on our 0 to 1 range, we end up having 0.3, or a third of it approximately, as our distance, 30%. So that's what our time's for. Your time can tell you basically how far it was along its line before it hit something. Location is the actual hit. This is our hit in world space of where we hit. If we were to stop this, debugging, and resume, you'll notice you have a square. This square along this wall is our hit point for our location, and this little square on the sphere here is the location hit point as well. That is going to be the location of the hit. If we go ahead and resume this, we'll look at the impact point. Now the impact point is pretty much the same case as a location. You're going to notice I have roughly the same answer here. But your location is, your location is pulled back for the surface of the object. And it's a non-penetrating location. It's basically the surface of our object that we hit, but not the actual hit point inside, not if we penetrate it. That's what our impact point would be. For the most part, these are going to be the same. If you notice, these are different slightly. It's because I have the trace complex turned on instead of simplified. If we go and run this with simple collision, we're going to notice our location and our impact point are going to be the same. We're not using complex collision, therefore our impact point is going to be very rough, and it's going to match our location. Basically, if you're using a line trace, these are going to be the same. If you're using something more complex, like a sweep shape test or a sphere, you may have a different impact point than your location. Most of the time, you're going to use your location as your actual hit point. Now we have our normal. I'm going to go ahead and show you the normal in use. Let me stop this. Disable my debugging and go ahead and hit play. Let's disable this as well. And now you notice we have no more line. We're not firing out from our originator and we're not hitting anything that we can see. We are technically still hitting it. We just don't have our debug on. What I'm going to do now is hook up our line trace by channel and turn on our visibility. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the hit location and I'm taking the normal of that hit and I'm reversing it and doing a line trace backwards. What we're going to see is we are firing the line from this sphere. It is hitting right here. Our impact point is going to be that square. I'm then taking the normal of the impact point and firing backwards along the direction of the normal. And as you can see in this case, it's basically forward and backwards because we have a flat surface. Our normal is facing back towards where we fired. Now because I am firing at a sphere, our impact point is going to be not on a flat surface, therefore our reflection or our normal is not going to be directly back at us. It's going to be at an angle. We're hitting higher up on the sphere. The normal is angled because we have a sphere and the normal then pushes back at this rough 45 degree angle we can see indicated by this red line. Basically, your normal and your impact normal, normal most of the time is what you're going to use, is your surface where you hit in the outward direction. So when you use a normal, you would know where the surface lies, where the up direction is, and it's useful for things like decals. You hit a surface, you put a decal of a bullet point, and you align it using the normal, and you now have a bullet hole in the wall that looks like it's part of the wall. So that's what our normal's for. Physical material. This is basically the physical material on the item we hit, and that's it. It's a reference to it. If we go ahead and simulate this, and we hit play, we'll see our physical material is going to be our default physical material. If we look at our hit result actor, and we look into our default settings, we're going to find the default for any of these. Our physical material is going to be our default physical material. I haven't changed anything, which means we have our default physical material. If you were to set up a custom physical material, it would return back that result. Now what it might be useful for is if you're doing something like checking to see the surface you hit. 
you have a metal wall. You put a metal physical material on it. That way you know when you hit it, you can check the physical material and maybe you play back an appropriate sound. Wood crunching for wood, metal tinging for metal. Or you do a line trace down, for example, and you know that you're stepping on grass, so you play a grass sound effect for feet, or snow, or metal. It's a common way in order to tell which surface you're on to give back the appropriate sound. Hit actor is going to be a reference to the actor that we hit. In this case, you can see it is the persistent level cube. This line trace, line trace 2, is hitting this cube in the background. If I was to change this to my line trace 3 and resume, it's going to get the WTF hit result actor. It's going to get this special actor I created right here. It's going to get the entire thing. It's this actor right here that I created, which we can actually see right here, which is a blueprint. That is usually what you would use if you want to pass along information. Maybe you want to destroy the actor. Here's the actor you want to destroy. Maybe you want to pass along a blueprint interface. Here's the actor you pass it along to. So that's how you can tell which actual blueprint actor you have hit. Now hit component is which portion of the actor you hit. Our actor right here is composed of a cube in the background, a sphere in the top left, and a sphere 2 in the bottom right. And then the entire thing is considered our hit result actor. So we have components which you can see here, three components, and then the entire actor. So our hit actor returns back the actor itself, whereas the hit component, you can see, is returning sphere 2. If we were to stop this, unhook our line trace at the end, turn back on our debug type, and turn this back on without debugging, you can see we are hitting sphere 2. You can see where it hits the sphere itself. Let's say I go back in here, and I move this over a little bit, and we hit play. You'll notice it's hitting the cube itself. We'll go back to our line trace. We'll tell it to debug. And we'll check out what we hit. And you'll now notice it's hitting the cube instead of the sphere too. So your component is going to be what component on the actor that we hit. Bone name is going to return back the bone name if you're using a skeletal mesh. As I'm not using a skeletal mesh, it's returning back none. If you are returning back a skeletal mesh, you're going to return back the bone. Now hit item is for primitive specific data. I have not been able to get any results back from this. If you know, if you're using primitive data, this will give you back the index of the item that you hit. Last two are pretty simple. Basically they are passed along but from our line trace itself or our sphere trace or our multi trace, whatever trace we're doing. It's simply the start and the end position of the trace. Keep in mind it is not the start and what we hit, but the start and the end. So in this case, we're starting at this location, we're going forward 1,000 units, and we're ending at this location. If we were to stop our debugging and resume, you'll notice our start point is the sphere, our end point is going to be this impact point here, and then our actual Oh, sorry, our hit point is right there. And our end point is way off in the distance. It's this green line that continues on off into the distance and it goes a thousand units. And you can see the end point actually over there. So that's the end off in the distance. So that's useful if you need to actually know where it starts and ends. You can always do a continual check. Maybe you're going to start at one point and you will go until it hits the location and then you will figure out how far along it went, figure out your new distance, and make a new trace from the new start point and continue on to the end. And maybe do multiple line traces just so you can actually see how far it goes, how many times maybe you're going to hit. But for example, something like that isn't really something you're going to want to do because you do have a multi-line trace, which gives you back a array of hits rather than one simple hit, and that's actually more likely. But maybe you want to know where you started and end if you want to just do multiple traces. So that is going to be our hit result. It is a structure. It contains multiple variables. It is useful when you are using traces. It's going to be your standard output from a trace, and it contains useful data for things such as 
You're firing a bullet, you want to see what it hits. Your character is walking, you want to see what they're walking on. You want to see if you have visibility between your AI and your player, for example. Or maybe uh, you throw a grenade and you want to see if your AI has visibility between what it's looking at and the grenade. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below.